I get called into HR and they say, we just lost our largest account and we have to let you and some other people go. And I was the happiest person that they've ever broke that type of news to in the history of HR relationships. I guarantee you that. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your daily helping. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the Daily Helping Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard, and we have a fantastic guest today. Joe Fairless is a full-time real estate investor who controls over $175 million worth of real estate in Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth. He has been investing in real estate since 2009, and prior to that, was the youngest vice president at an award-winning advertising agency in New York City. He is the host of the world's longest-running daily real estate podcast, Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, where he has interviewed guests such as Barbara Corcoran, Emmett Smith, and Robert Kiyosaki. Joe is a Forbes contributor and member of the Forbes Real Estate Council, as well as the author of two best-selling books, Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, Volumes 1 and 2. Joe, great to have you. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. Nice to be on the show and grateful to be here and looking forward to talking to everyone. So I want to jump right in because there's so many different exciting things that we can talk about. But as you know, I often start because I'm so interested in people's backgrounds and their journeys. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your early days, because I know that what you were doing a long time ago is in no way in the stratosphere of what you're doing now. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I was working with uh, toddlers before I started buying apartment communities. And I actually was a preschool teacher while I was in college. I went to school at Texas Tech University. And when I was in college, I got a job because at a daycare because I needed a job. And it just, I don't know, I just randomly applied to this daycare because I was applying basically everywhere that had an hourly wage spot available. And I got the job and I really liked it. I was called Mr. Joe by over a hundred preschoolers. I worked with a class of three-year-olds, a class of four and five-year-olds, uh, three-year-olds and maybe five and six-year-olds, and then a class of six to like 13-year-olds. And I did that an entire, it's like three years while I was in college now that I have got that experience, I know even though I don't have kids, I I have a taste of what it's like and I, I really enjoyed it. I actually worked as a Manny after college. And if anyone's not familiar with that term, it's a male nanny after college while I had my full-time job at an advertising agency because I wanted to earn extra income and uh, just continue to you know, use that skill set. And I found that surprisingly, there weren't a lot of males that were doing what I was doing. So I was able to kind of corner the market in New York City at the time. And I was, you know, very busy working weekends, Saturday and Sundays. And then I had my full time job Monday through Friday. Amer I would say New York's most eligible Manny. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your full time job at the time? It was working at an advertising agency right out, of, right out of college. I moved from Lubbock, Texas, so cows and cotton, to New York City, skyscrapers and no sun. And I was working on Madison Avenue right out of college. I worked at an advertising agency called TBWA Shiat Day for any Super Bowl commercial people out there. They did a, the ad for Apple 
where they the woman came into the like the movie theater and threw the mallet into the movie screen and crashed the screen and it was a playoff of I think 1984 the book and you know, I worked for a Shiat day then I climbed the corporate ladder uh, relatively quickly became the youngest vice president of a different advertising agency and then while I was you know the youngest VP I just was working my the Manny stuff on the weekends and then you know doing other things to uh, keep me busy and enjoy the journey. And a really interesting journey, particularly you know moving from Lubbock to New York City. I imagine that was a, a wild transition. But I, I'm curious, Joe, because what you've described working in the advertising agencies, doing the Manny type activities, these are dollars per hour kind of jobs essentially. So what you're doing now is so different. How did you start becoming interested and involved in real estate investing? Yeah. And and on the dollars per hour thing, you're so right. But one thing, one asterisk I want to mention with the advertising thing, if I was paid dollars per hour, I would have been much happier because they had me on a salary and I was working. (laughs) I was, I was working 60, I had a lot of hours a week. And if I had paid, if I got paid dollars per hour, I was actually going to make be making more. Uh, My salary was $30,000 after college and in New York city in 2005, that's not a whole lot. I think my my paycheck was seven hundred and seventy five dollars every two weeks that i that I got my rent was a seven fifty so it was it was a, a a tough thing plus I had student loans that I had to pay back of about twenty thousand dollars or so uh so yeah i mean the the financial mindset was imperative that i I honed it otherwise I would just keep getting caught up in what a lot of people get caught up in. And that's having too much month at the end of the money, as Jim Rohn used to say. (laughs) And uh, what I did is I started studying finances. I, I read the book. My first book I read was a little above my pay grade, but I still read it and it's investing for dummies. <laughs> and I, I read that book and I, I was finally able to comprehend it a couple of times. I'm kidding. I, I read it once and I, it talks about the three different ways of investing one stocks and bonds, two is investing in startups or LLCs and three is investing in real estate. And I have a sister who is a real estate agent. My dad was a real estate agent back in the day. He no longer is. And I lived in an apartment building. So I knew kind of what real estate was all about. And that was most familiar to me. So I gravitated towards real estate. And I just read a whole bunch of books, a whole bunch of books. And I still do. I read a ton. I read three books a month uh, on average. After reading those books and learning about it, then I started attending seminars. I started talking to people who were in it. And that's where I realized, okay, I can have this full-time job where I wish I got paid more. And eventually I did as I climbed the corporate ladder. And I can do this manning thing where I am definitely an hourly wage person. But then also I can supplement it with this income from a property. Once I buy it, it then in theory, assuming I buy it correctly, which I have not done sometimes. And most of the time, fortunately I have done, it makes me money every month. And all I need to do is simply check my bank account after every month or the beginning of the month and make sure that the rents were deposited and were good. And so that's what really was the aha moment for me. It's interesting. So almost out of necessity, because as you as you said, more month than money at the end of the day, uh, was was it for you like an epiphany, like the little cartoon light bulb over your head, like oh my god, this could really change my life. It was in the moment that it happened. I remembered this distinctly because I was in New York City. I was walking past my bank and I saw that they had this APR for, I believe, like, I I, I forget the percentage, we'll say 1% on a CD. And I didn't know what a CD was. 
I I asked them, what's a CD? And they said, certificate of deposit. Here's how it works. We, you invest a thousand while I only had a thousand extra. I said, okay. And then what? Well, then we have it for 12 months and then we pay you a return on it at the end of 12 months. And I said, oh, well, that's the best thing that that's more than what I'm making in my savings account where the thousand dollars is. Then let's do it. Well, after 12 very, very long months of them holding my only thousand dollars hostage, I got my thousand dollars back and I got sixteen dollars in profit on top of that. Sixteen dollars after twelve months. I remember every single month, like, oh man, I wish I had a thousand dollars. And and then at the end, I was taxed on that sixteen dollars. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, wait a second, there's got to be a better way. And I remember taxi cab drivers or taxi cabs were like whizzing by me. The the horns in the city were honking, and I was like, what is going on here? And I said, there's got to be a better way. And that's really when I kicked into gear because, you know, with real estate, you get a lot of tax advantages and there are, there are other benefits to it, but it's, it's typically a higher cover charge to get into real estate than just a thousand dollar certificate of deposit. So I knew that I had to get to saving money and that's why I really started doing a lot of manning and focus on my career and climb the corporate ladder and, and found other ways to make some money and then save a lot of money while I was in New York. What's interesting, Joe, and I was thinking about this as you were telling the the CD story, which, which is wild. Uh, you know, our society banks, they advertise. So I get advertisements in my email all the time for, you know, CDs and things like that. I mean, the the banks are, it's their incentive because they pay us a very low return on something like a CD or getting 1%. But that's not what they do with the money, right? They turn around and and are much more aggressive with turning your $1,000 into quite a lot more for, for them. Right. Yeah. They're, they're then using that thousand and bar letting someone borrow it on a mortgage at say 4% or maybe a line of credit that perhaps they don't even need to out to actually hand that cash out. They just have it as a, as you know, if that person uses the line of credit, but that's 7% or a small business loan at 8%. And they're making the spread between the 8% and the 1%. So they're making 7% on that $1,000. A pretty sweet deal for them, but but not so great for us. So talk to us now about you had the, the epiphany, you want to start dabbling in real estate investing. Talk to us about how you transitioned into that, lessons you've learned, and some good kind of basic real estate investing 101 tips for people listening to this that have never done it before, didn't think it's for them. What what I felt is what, and we were talking before the show that perhaps some of your listeners have felt before, and that's I felt stuck in my life because I was doing this job that I initially liked, but then over time, I liked a little bit less and a little bit less because I wasn't fulfilled. I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan, and he talks about the six human needs, and I won't go into all six of them, but the last two growth and contribution lead to fulfillment. And I didn't feel like I was growing. I didn't feel like I was contributing in a meaningful way, working in advertising. And even though I had created this career and a successful one, I just wasn't digging it anymore. And what I did, and this is what I would suggest anyone who feels stuck in their full-time job or just in general, even if you don't have a full-time job, if you're you know, stay at home with kids or if you're you know, doing something else and you feel stuck, what I would suggest, because this worked for me, is I sampled life experiences. And what I mean by that specifically is while I had my full-time job, I uh, took a stand-up comedy class. While I had my full-time job, I took an improv class. While I had my full-time job, I was also teaching a class on how to 
invest in real estate to do what I was doing, how to buy in a cash flowing market, Texas, while living in New York City. A lot of my friends in advertising were like, you're buying houses? I said, yeah. Where are you buying them in Texas? How are you doing that? Well, I got that question a lot. So I created a class on it. I also you know, did some other things. You know, I was involved in a nonprofit. I was doing a flag football league, softball league, etc. My point is that when I felt stuck, I wanted to sample different things and identify where should my next phase in life or focus be. And that's how I was able to really transition the real estate Oh, by the way, I was also interviewing people on how they were successful in their career. I was writing a book, which still hasn't been published, by the way. I've, I've published other books, but not that book. It still hasn't been published. And I was able to identify real estate as the, as the path that I wanted to pursue moving forward. Therefore, through sampling life experiences, I was able to see, okay, I like this. I don't like this. I want a little bit more of this. And uh, that's how the real estate thing really evolved into a full-time job or full-time profession. Rather, I knew I needed to leave my advertising job because I just wasn't fulfilled. And after sampling the life experiences, I identified real estate. What was the reaction like amongst your peers at the advertising agency when you said you were leaving to to be a full-time real estate investor? Well, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York. I believe it was October of 2012. Our office was shut down. The advertising office was shut down for a month because our basement floor of the building that we worked at on Wall Street was flooded and it messed up all the mechanicals of the building. So they had to let it dry out and replace it. Well, I I worked from home for a month and I realized during that time, I was like, man, this is exactly what I should be doing because in addition to doing my advertising work, I was working on all this other stuff that I just mentioned earlier that I was sampling. And I really enjoyed that other stuff a whole lot more than my advertising job. I wrote an email to my family in November I have that email printed on my wall. I have an inspiration wall in my office. And the email basically says that I came, I conquered, and I don't care about it anymore, period, at all. So I will be leaving my advertising job at the end of this year in December, unless my refinance on my house doesn't go through. Well, fast forward to early December, not when I was going to quit, but early December, I get called into HR and they say, we just lost our largest account and we have to let you and some other people go. And I was the happiest person that they've ever broke that type of news to in the history of HR relationships. I guarantee you that. I was like, oh, okay. And they said, we'll give you a severance package for two months. We're, we're sorry. Well, whatever we can do to help. I was like, well, what, what can I do to help you out? Or do you need help? Like, <laughs> I immediately just, I, I was so happy because I, instead of, you know, cutting bait with them, they were letting me out the door and it was a two month thing. So it, as far as the reaction with my advertising buddies, it was a little bit mixed at first because like, oh, are you all right? I was like, I'm great. I was actually, I swear to you, I was actually planning on quitting. I have an email to prove it. Uh, then after after that, they're like, okay, so you, you're, I know you you said that, but are you, you getting another job? I was like, no, I'm actually going to be focusing on, on real estate. Uh, and believe it or not, I was also wanting to be a career consultant for people who wanted to do better in advertising and PR. And I launched a website, spent $3,000 on it, and it flopped, flopped big time. No one replied. And what I realized is that I launched something and I put a whole lot of work on the front end, but I didn't have customers. On the flip side with real estate, I had a lot of people saying, Joe, if you ever buy something larger, let me know. So I had customers before I had a product. And that's when you really know you have a good business. You have a little venture going if you have the customers before you have the product. Uh, so 
when I focused on the real estate thing and I had customers for the product, then I had to just go find the product. Fantastic. So one of the things that has been really sticking out through all of your shares is that focus on experiences. And by walking away from, from your job, although actually they, as you said, fired you, that you <laughs> laid you off, that you were going to leave anyhow, it gave you time freedom, that freedom to explore these other life experiences. And I think that's something that most people don't even think about in terms of their time, that they even could do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And, and so now here we are, it's, it's 2017 and you are one of the most well-known real estate investors in the world. And tell us about the inspiration for your podcast. The podcast is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. I have had an episode air every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the last 1,130 days, every single day. Haven't missed a day. Now I batch them. So I don't do an interview every day from, you know, just peek behind the curtains. The inspiration was that I wanted to learn more f about real estate investing. I wanted to build relationships with people and I wanted to grow my business. And the podcast has done all three things. That's fantastic. So you are out there every day giving advice on how to do real estate investing, which is terrific. So let's do uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, a mini crash course. So for those of us listening who have never done this before, how do we get started? How do you get started? Well, I'd say educate yourself just like you're listening to this wonderful podcast on you know, helping you improve yourself and you know, do better for others through that wonderful acts of kindness uh, movement that you've got going on. I'd say listen to other podcasts, listen to, well, I've got a podcast, number one. Number two, read books. There are a ton of really good books out there. Rich Dad, Poor Dad would be a good start to serve as inspiration. It doesn't give a lot of nuts and bolts, but it is a good starter book. Real Estate Investing for Dummies would be another book to get started. The key to real estate investing, based on what I've seen, in the way to mitigate as much risk as possible is to invest for cash flow. Some people getting started will make the mistake of buying a property in a really nice area, but it doesn't make them money every month. And then what happens when the market shifts, they get foreclosed on because they're having to pay out of pocket the mortgage, the other expenses, they, they lose the property. That's what happened in 2008. The only reason why people got in trouble in 2008 when Armageddon happened with our economy uh, is because they bought for appreciation, not cash flow. And there are two other things you can do to mitigate the risk on that front. One is make sure you have enough operating budget set aside, so cash reserves set aside for your purchase and make sure you have a loan that is not a balloon payment that comes due in a near period, a short period of time. Instead, get a 30 year loan or something like that. And I'm just talking about single family homes. I'm not talking about commercial real estate. Uh, so single family home, 30 year loan, maybe a 15 year, if you want to be aggressive on paying it down faster. But I, I think you should get a 30. And then if you want to pay it down faster, then just pay a little bit more every month. Now you won't get as low of an interest rate as you would with a 15 year, but still you have some more flexibility uh, if you get your 30. So to summarize, buy for cash flow, not appreciation. Make sure you have a nice long-term loan on the property. And make sure you have enough cash reserves to uh, cover any unexpected expenses because they will come up. One example is I have a home. It makes me about 250 bucks a month. But then when someone moves out, 
every three or so years, guess what? It cost me about $5,000 to repair it, to get it moving ready. And basically I'm breaking even on that house uh, over that period of time. And so my key for that house in particular, because I didn't buy it right to get enough cash flow at the front end, is to have the tenant live there for as long as possible. So I'm not as aggressive on the rent increases because I want to keep them in there longer. One of the main, no, the main expense you're going to come across is tenant turnover. So you want to keep those tenants in there as long as possible, generally speaking. And what about transitioning? You mentioned single family homes. What about transitioning from single family homes to buildings like duplexes or apartment communities or things like that, where you could have multiple tenants? That's ideally the path of progress. The properties that are one to four units, so duplex, triplex, fourplex, or quadplex, those are all considered residential and you get a residential loan. So you get the same type of loan on a fourplex that you would if you bought a single family house. Once you go five units and above, then you get into commercial loans. And the main difference between a residential loan and a commercial loan is that the residential loan, you and your income is incredibly important to the lender. Whereas on a commercial loan, the property's P&L, how much the property makes or loses is more important because they consider that a commercial property and if they, they have to get it back from you for not paying the, the mortgage then they want to make sure that property is generating cash flow versus the, the residential. Uh, so that, that's the main difference as far as, you know, transitioning. I went from four single family homes to then buying an apartment community that's over 150 units. And it's a, that's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother time I imagine. But I mean, basically I just took the same approach that I described earlier for getting started with single families. You read books, you meet people, you listen to podcasts, and you uh, then align yourself with others who are doing what you're, you're wanting to do, and you grow with them and you learn from them. Awesome. And I, and I know that your best practices book is yet to be published, but you have published a, a real estate investing book. Talk to us about that a little bit. So my podcast name is Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever. You'll never guess what my book name is. It's called The Best Real Estate Investing <laughs> Advice Ever. <laughs> and I have published two now. I've got The Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, Volume 1. Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank, she personally endorsed the book, said it was a no-fluff book, and had some really good advice. So she said something like that. It's on the cover of the book. And then the second book, is called The Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, Volume 2. And both of those are available on Amazon or probably wherever else books are sold. And we'll have uh, the links, for those of you driving in the car, we'll have links to Joe's books in the show notes and in the Daily Helping app. I want to kind of bring it back full circle, here, full circle here before we wrap up, because I'm curious, now that you've been doing the real estate investing and doing it with such a high level of success, what did you take from those life experiences from doing the improv, from the daycare, from being a Manny? How do those experiences inform what you're doing today? I'd say, well, being a Manny and doing improv and interviewing people for a book are just all completely different. The common thread for them would be listening, really. Listening to the feedback you're getting connecting on a, a human level. I mean, with, if you're in a class teaching 12, three-year-olds, you're completely 100% engaged with them. You have to be, and they have to see it and you got to be on their level. I mean, there, there's, there's no fake in that. You, you have to be on point. Uh, otherwise chaos ensues with improv and stand up comedy you have to be in tune with what the audience the reception the audience given you and then roll with it when interviewing people for a book same thing and all roads lead back to being able to 
have a connection with people and then ultimately serve them first. And then by serving them, you know, you'll, you'll be, you'll get taken care of too. And you know, that aligns with your, your approach to, I imagine based on what I, I know about you and what I've, what I've read on your, your, your uh, website. I mean, we, we haven't even talked about it, but yeah, my philosophy and I have it printed on a big old poster in my office is the secret to living is giving. I mean, that, that's my approach. It's a Tony Robbins saying that he mentioned on a Ted talk and I listened to it about four years ago or so and five years ago. And I've, I've adopted it ever since. And every component of every part of my business has a giving back component. I've sponsored a, a student at Texas tech to come to New York city for uh, three days to, to intern or to shadow rather advertising agency professionals. I've done that for the last five years and I am on the board for junior achievement, all the profits, by the way, to both my books, volume one and volume two, all the profits go to junior achievement of Cincinnati to help kids in underserved communities. I don't make a penny off of that. All of them, all of it goes to junior achievement. I've donated over $10,000 to them already. Uh, for junior achievement. So, you know, all roads lead back to the secret to living is giving. I love that. I, I absolutely love that and, and hope that everybody listening to this prints it out and puts it on their their own inspiration wall, Joe. That's fantastic. And you might have just answered it, but as you know, because we're kind of at time here, I ask all my guests, what is their biggest helping? And that is the single most important piece of information to, for somebody to walk away with after listening to today's episode. If you feel stuck, then start sampling life experiences. If you feel stuck, then get unstuck. Go, go test some things out. Go on Groupon. Go do a class. Go... I mean, classes for woodworking might be like $10. You might not ever want to do it again, but at least you try it out. Go on Eventbrite, go attend a meetup, some random meetup, some book club. I've done book clubs before. Go on meetup.com and go to a networking event. If you feel stuck and you feel like you're wanting to evolve into something else or at least see different things, then those are all resources that I recommend and just sample stuff. I mean, eventually, most likely, what you're doing now is if you're feeling like it's not completely fulfilling, then you'll take some aspects of what you're doing now and you'll evolve it into something else. In order to evolve it, you need to have some context for what else is out there. Perfect. Joe, where can people find you? You just Google Joe Fairless and my website's Joe Fairless. Uh, the podcast, if in your podcast app, just search Joe Fairless and the my podcast will come up. Very good. And for all those road warriors out there listening to this, we will have all the links for all things Joe Fairless in the show notes and on the Daily Helping app. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was an awesome discussion. My pleasure. And for anyone who, on the single family home front uh, who wants to have the evaluation guide that I created for single family homes, you can email info info at joefairless.com and we'll get you the free single family home guide. Fantastic. Outstanding. Well, Joe, thank you again for being here today and thank each and every one of you. Thanks to you guys for listening to this episode. If you like what you heard, go subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a five-star review because this is what helps other people find the podcast. But most importantly, go out there today and do something nice for somebody else, even if you don't know who they are and post it in your feeds using the hashtag MyDailyHelping because the happiest people are those that help others. <laughs>